Hello viewers, I'm Sarah Bukhari and you're watching Power Dilemmas here with Sarah Bukhari. So executive of any party or organization call meetings, uh, they create rules, they uh, make regulations, and it is a difficult task to be an executive. Uh, recently, Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario's executive was elected and uh, we've got very worthy uh, members uh, being executive of the uh, Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. So today in my show, we have a very worthy guest, a uh, political strategist and a uh, politician, uh, councillor of Niagara Region, Tony Cork. Tony, welcome to my show, Power Dilemmas. Thank um, you, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. And I'm looking forward to having a, a very detailed discussion uh, with Tony about uh, politics, uh, issues in uh, Niagara Falls and Niagara region, and of course, uh, the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. So, uh, Tony, you are a resident of Grimsby. Grimsby, am I pronouncing it right? That is right. The town of Grimsby in the region of Niagara. We're one of 12 municipalities that make up Niagara region. We have a two-tier level of local government, the local area and the regional level, and I serve on the regional council. Okay, so you serve on the regional councillor. So Grimsby is a beautiful old city, uh, lots of heritage. How do you, let me start my first question by asking you how are you going to promote tourism in the city of, this beautiful city of Grimsby? So th that's a great question, Sarah. We always look at the great things that we have happening in Grimsby. Uh, a couple examples, we have a lot of natural heritage. We're right uh, nestled between the lake and the escarpment. As you leave Hamilton, you enter Grimsby, and we are the gateway to Niagara. So you can get off the highway in Grimsby and take all these beautiful scenic back road tours uh, and scenic tours of Niagara region, starting in Grimsby and going along the wine route, or you can go up on the escarpment and follow the Bruce Trail if you're into hiking. Uh, we have some beautiful uh, scenery. If you want to walk along the escarpment, we also have Beamer Falls, which is a conservation area monitored by the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Area. And that is the home of the Hawk Watch, which is the site of the largest uh, bird of prey migration in North America. And that starts in the spring and is just ending right about now. Uh, and I believe we've had over 18,000 birds of prey fly over uh, Grimsby. So if you're a birder and you like uh, watching the bird migration, Grimsby is the place to see it. Okay, I am going to because it's summer. I'm going to um, I'm going to take a special visit to uh, Grimsby, and I tell all my viewers to uh, go to Grimsby and uh, meet maybe meet uh, Councillor of Grimsby. Okay, let's talk about uh, first of all congratulations Thank on you. being the second vice president of Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. So, as a second vice president of uh, the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario, uh, what are your uh, duties? What is your role? So the numbered vice Vice presidents in the party have roles assigned to them by the president and our newly elected president of the party Rick Dykstra has assigned me with the riding redistribution program initially so my committee is responsible for making sure there's a smooth transition from the 107 ridings uh, electoral districts that we have in Ontario currently to 122 which we'll have in time for the next provincial election in 2018 uh, however we have to have that finished by November 30th of this year. So that's that's a lot of hands-on work with the various uh, riding associations. And we are working closely with our current executive and the local executives to make sure there's a smooth transition. We have to have founding meetings for the new ridings that are created. We have to make sure all the money and debts are allocated between the uh, the shifting riding boundaries. So that's, that's going to tie me up for most of the summer. Mm -hmm. How strong and how important mm -hmm. executive is for a party? So uh, w being on the executive, I think it's very important. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, we have our leader, Patrick Brown, who relies on the party executive to make sure that the party apparatus, the organization, the policy development, the membership are uh, treated with respect and are followed through to our constitution. So we have a double mandate. We are responsible to all the members of the party who elected us, and we are responsible to the leader uh, for the direction that he gives the party. So we are kind of that meeting point between the membership and the leader's office, as well as making sure that we work closely with the PC Ontario Fund to make sure we have the financial resources 
to run the next election and run the party. So we are, we are a good group of people who are committed as volunteers to make sure our party is running well and organized appropriately. Mm -hmm. Now that you have mentioned uh, election 2018, I have seen there are lots of political hopefuls and they are gearing up uh, to maybe get themselves nominated. Um, are, we, are we or is the Progressive Conservative Party uh, winning in 2018? I believe so, 100%. We'll have a strong majority government uh, led by Premier Patrick Brown. I'm looking forward to being able to say that. I am very encouraged by the number of people and the quality of people and the caliber of our potential candidates who are already coming forward and want to represent Patrick Brown and the Ontario PC party in the next election. Uh, we have to caution people that we're not quite ready to open the nominations yet. We have to go through this redistribution process and then we will open up the nominations uh, early. Our leader has asked us to get a full uh, slate of candidates and a full team very quickly. He wants those candidates to be his representatives to the local riding associations and to the local Areas. So we'll be looking uh, sooner rather than later in 2017 to start the nomination process up. And as I said, I'm very encouraged by the, the quality of people that are coming forward. Uh, I think that speaks well to how people feel Patrick is going to do, but it also speaks well to the sort of Ontario that a lot of people are hoping to have, uh, and Patrick Brown represents the best hope for that. Mm -hmm. Do you see any hurdles? Um, Organizationally, no. There's no hurdles that we are going to experience from an organization, which as the executive, uh, my role is to make sure that we don't have any problems organizationally. Um, some of the big hurdles are we expect fully that the people who are happy with the status quo, the happy with the high debt and high spending that the current wind government is providing Ontario. There are people who are benefiting from the scandals and corruption that we see at Queen's Park. And those people are going to work tooth and nail, fight us to make sure that they don't lose their position of power. And I think as we see this uh, old, stale liberal government that is further and further out of touch with the people of Ontario, uh, do everything they can, throw everything but the kitchen sink at our leader, um, I think you're going to see uh, that there will be people who will question his his capabilities. And we will have our hurdle is to make sure that everyone knows that Patrick Brown is ready to be leader. He's got the team that's ready to lead Ontario and that we have the policies and platforms and programs in place to make sure that we fix and turn around the problems that are facing Ontario right now. Excessive regulation, excessive taxation, incredible debt, lack of spending on key infrastructure projects, fights with teachers, fights with nurses, fights with doctors. That all has to change, and I believe Patrick Brown's the person to do that. Mm -hmm. What is executive or progressive conservative party doing to involve uh, more uh, new immigrants and ethnic communities and the diverse communities living in Ontario? Well, I'll just explain a couple things to go back. Our party has a one member, one vote process for selecting the leader. So if you are a member of the party, as of a certain date, you were entitled to vote for the leadership. And I think in this last round of the leadership contest that we just had last year in which Patrick Brown was chosen as our leader, Patrick reached out to many, many ethnic communities and he did a fantastic job of bringing new immigrants, new uh, people into the party that would not normally consider themselves PC party members. And I think that speaks volumes to the sort of character that Patrick has and his ability to reach out to new Canadians and bring them into the party fold and basically say to them, our values are your values. The values of the PC party of Ontario um, are the values that you came to Canada to seek and be able to promote uh, a better life for you and your children. And if you see that the PC party has traditionally through history be a party that builds up Ontario, we build roads, we build infrastructure, we are there to be the government that is best uh, best situated to provide economic growth without burdening future generations with debt and outlandish taxes and crazy regulations. Um, Patrick Brown is the person who's going to lead us forward on that front. Okay, now let's dive to your role as the uh, regional councillor for the region of Niagara. Sure, uh, absolutely. Representing the town of Grimsby. So tell us about your role as a councillor. So, uh, as I said, the Niagara region is a two-tier level of government, so much like Peel region and Brampton uh, or Durham region, we have our local area municipalities and we have 12 of them in 
Niagara, and all 12 mayors sit on the regional council. And then the remaining 18 seats at the regional council are allocated by population. And Grimsby, because we're one of the smaller towns, we get one extra councillor at the regional council table. And I was fortunate enough to be elected uh, in 2014 to be that regional council. So I'm one of 30 at the regional council table. And as a new councillor, I've jumped in with both feet and sitting on uh, a lot of committees, a lot of different committees. Uh, and I'm fortunate enough to chair the audit committee and the transportation steering committee. So those are two key roles, uh, as well as vice chair of public works that are able to, as I said, uh, build Niagara and get it ready for future growth. Okay, there's a lot of talk about integrated transit system. Uh, just elaborate, what is integrated transit system and what's the plan, what's going on well, there? Well, I think people who live in big cities would be surprised to realize or find out that down in Niagara, we don't have a region-wide transit system. Our transit system is a bit of a hodgepodge each transit system is operated by the local area municipalities. So we have Niagara Falls has Niagara Transit, Welland has Welland Transit, St. Catharines has St. Catharines Transit. Some of the municipalities have a small bus type system. Niagara on the Lake has a single route system. Pelham and Font Hill have just designed a, a system. Um, but they are prohibited to cross intermunicipal boundaries uh, without agreements and without cost sharing. So the region has been working on a pilot project to have an uh, intermunicipal transit system that fully integrates our existing transit system providers as well as to provide the linkages we'll need when uh, GO train service extends all the way down to Niagara Falls. So that's what our integrated uh, intermunicipal transit project is all about and that's uh, one of the projects I get to work on as transportation steering committee chair. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So uh, there have been talks of uh, connecting Niagara region to the GTA region th through the GO train. So what is that uh, plan because it's going to create a lot of jobs and a lot of lots of other opportunities. And a fantastic opportunities from growth wherever mm -hmm. the GO train goes I think you would see uh, the growth that follows it as well as the ability to get people to jobs and from jobs, as well as the tourist aspect. Niagara has a fantastic tourism history, Niagara Falls specifically. Um, currently, we have a GO bus that runs from Hamilton and Stony Creek into the uh, Niagara region. And we have been working basically the past term of council and this term of council are putting together a comprehensive business case to present to Metrolinx and the Ontario government as to why Ontario, a uh, GO train transit down to Niagara makes sense and why Ontario should invest in that. Uh, we presented the business plan to the Minister of Transportation this past spring and there were a bunch of hurdles that we had to jump through. There were uh, a bunch of uh, issues that we had to address, including crossing the Welland Canal so we didn't interfere with uh, the ship timing uh, for the Welland Canal transportation. So those are all issues that came forward when we're trying to get GO train full today, all day GO train service to Niagara. Because right now in the summer we have the uh, GO train service that goes basically to Niagara Falls okay. on the weekend GO train. It's a fantastic service. It's mm -hmm. got great ridership. Lots of people are using it. Um, but it's a tourism tool for bringing people to Niagara on the GO train. Only and in the summers? Only in the summers. And it's actually, I believe, just started up again uh, recently. Um, but that is only part of the picture. We have to build the stations throughout the Niagara region okay. from Grimsby, Lincoln, St. Catharines, and Niagara Falls, and then allow our transit systems to link into that, that GO train service. So we're really excited. This past provincial budget announced that um, Niagara region is one of the ones that are being targeted, and we're hopeful that this June uh, we'll be getting more details from Metrolinx. What is the cost of this project? Um, we're looking at an investment in Niagara of about $120 million, okay. of which we are committed to paying a third of that, $40 million, for the infrastructure required to build the stations. Mm -hmm. And once we get the go-ahead and the provinces approve that, we'll, we'll hopefully see service happening uh, sooner rather than later.
Yeah, what any any um, uh, dates and uh, in your mind? I don't want to. I don't want to jinx <laughs> things, but we're very hopeful to have service in uh, the train service is coming to all the way to Hamilton at Centennial Parkway uh, by 2018, and we're hoping that if we have all the infrastructure in place at the same time, we should be able to piggyback on there and be ready by 2018 as well. Okay, so you you are representing the city of Grimsby and uh, Niagara I region. I have to say the town of Grimsby because we're not a town, city yet, and we're, and we're a beautiful yeah, little yeah. town of town Grimsby. Of Grimsby. <laughs> uh, what, let's talk about the uh, crime rate in that area because um, uh, GTA is expanding. People are wanting to live all around GTA, and uh, how is the crime rate in that area? So I have to say we're very fortunate in Niagara region as a whole. We have a very low crime rate in terms of uh, violent crimes or crimes against people. Um, we are very fortunate. We have an integrated police force across the whole region that does a fantastic job at keeping crime rate down. With that said, we have had uh, murders and we have had uh, a, a deaths that happen in any, any population the size of 400,000, which is Niagara region, we tend to have, um, but not so much in the smaller uh, rural parts of the region. It is very uh, laid back and relaxed. Um, most people feel very safe. Um, my uh, and my father, who, who's lived in Grimsby since he moved here from England in 1968, still doesn't lock his car door at night. So uh, we, have, uh, we have petty thefts and we have, um, we have uh, drug issues. Um, but all in all, we're very fortunate that we don't experience the level of violent crime that happens in, in sort of the Toronto and the Hamilton areas. Mm -hmm. So if people want to move and buy property in Grimsby, they can, right? Oh, without <laughs> question. In fact, they should do so sooner rather than later mm -hmm. because uh, prices are going up. <laughs> okay. But we are we're very uh, very fortunate with the growth that we're experiencing. We've managed to maintain a small town feel. Um, we have our downtown Grimsby that, as you mentioned, when we opened is very uh, known for its heritage and the historical aspects of it. And we try to protect that as much as possible in the downtown, especially. Um, we have some beautiful old homes uh, that date back to the War of 1812. And Grimsby was the site of the very first municipal uh, meeting in Ontario um, for municipal, uh, municipal Township 7 was hosted in just outside our, where our museum is now. So we have a history of being involved in municipal politics and we are uh, happy to have anyone come down and visit anytime. Okay, so in your personal capacity, you design pollution control equipment. Tell yes. us about what is that? Yes, uh, so this is the boring part of the interview. Uh, <laughs> I, I design dust collectors, uh, fume extractors, uh, cyclones for industrial air quality pollution. So if you have a factory that is manufacturing anything and they are producing oil mist or smoke or even woodworking shops and schools, uh, I design uh, what I call glorified vacuum cleaners, big dust collectors, uh, bag houses, uh, to make sure that the air is clean and the workplace is uh, clean and that we're not exhausting uh, particulate into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I always ask this question to my guests, uh, what was your impetus to join politics? Well, I was involved in Grimsby in my capacity as a, a member of the Kinsmen, which is a service organization like the Lions and the Rotary. And through that, I became involved with many of the things going on in the town. And it really gave me an opportunity to see what it was to serve, but I also saw some of the frustrations dealing with a small town council. So in 2003, I ran for uh, the local area municipal council and was successful in 2003. Um, ran again in 2006 and was not as successful in that I lost, but I stayed involved with the downtown improvement area. And then in 2014, I decided I wanted to be more heavily involved with some of the issues that were affecting Niagara region. So I I decided that that was a good opportunity for me to serve serve there. If a person wants to be involved in politics or run for office, what should that person do? What are the uh, qualities a person should have or should inculcate in themselves? <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to learn patience. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that I am not a very patient person and I want things to happen right now and I don't understand when people can't see my point of view like that. It becomes uh, frustrating sometimes, but the patient side of it is important. You need to have uh, a family that's willing to support you and put up with weird, crazy hours and crazy phone calls and people who are going to blame you for the woes in their life simply because you're the politician and you're the best target. Um, but ultimately, 
I think you have to have a, a little bit of self-depreciation. You have to not take yourself too seriously. Um, but you have to recognize that you have a serious job because you are representing the people who voted for you and you're re representing the people who didn't vote for you. Your job is to make the best decision with the best information and try to make life a little bit better for everyone. Um, I enjoy doing it because I have the time to give to do it and I like being involved. Um, and I will also tell you, you have to be prepared to do a lot of reading. Uh, I think since I last saw you, these glasses are new because my eyes have started to get the strain from reading all these things. So I, I think that is part of it. The other part of it is you have to actually believe, and this is where you have to have the ego necessary, and I don't mean a big swelled head ego, you have to have the ego to believe that you yes. can make a difference and you can do it better than the other guy. Um, and if you, can, if you can believe that in yourself, in you, yourself, you can be a very good politician. Um, you can be a good leader and then you can be a, a good politician as well if you're prepared to listen. Okay. From here, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to continue our discussion on politics with Tony Cork. Welcome back. You are listening and watching uh, Power Dilemmas here with Sarah Bukhari. Uh, we have a very active political strategist here with us in the studios, and uh, um, we, we have uh, talked about various aspects of uh, political process in Ontario. Uh, so we're going to continue our interview with the Tony Cork on a few issues like sex ed, uh, partisan politics, and uh, a policy uh, process in the PC party. So welcome back again to my uh, show, Tony. And uh, let's talk about the policy process in the Progressive Conservative Party. How does that work? That's a great question. The policy that we are developing as a party is being generated from the ground up. We are embracing a large-scale consultation with both members and non-members um, who can go to a website, forontario.ca, and give us their ideas. And we are looking for the best ideas. Our leader, Patrick Brown, has said there are no, it doesn't matter who's come up with an idea, if it's a good idea, we'll embrace it. If there is a way to make Ontario a better place to live, if there is a way to run government more efficiently, more effectively, if there is a way to save taxpayers money or to invest more wisely, we will embrace it. So we are reaching out to not just our members, uh, but all across Ontario through this website. You don't have to be a member to participate, and you can give us your ideas uh, to be included in the platform. Those ideas are being filtered up uh, through the process. You can vote on them. There'll be polls on the website so we can garner the best, uh, best ideas and bring them forward into a coherent platform. And they will be brought to the party in the policy conference next spring, uh, spring of 2017. And at that point, the party membership will vote on which ones they want to see included in the platform. So it's a very, uh, very inclusive process. It is a very, um, uh, strong reliance on the uh, grassroots and we also have a, a series of policy advisory councils so each area of subject goes through a policy advisory council uh, that involves a caucus member so the whole idea is that our policy platform will be generated by the membership as well as uh, approved by the membership generated from the good ideas that we get across Ontario and working through caucus so that there's no surprises in our platform. When, we, uh, when the leader stands up in the next election and says, here are the things that we stand for as the Ontario PC party, no one is going to be surprised. There's not going to be um, anything in that platform that anyone will say, well, now where did that come from? Or I never heard that before. It's going to be a very inclusive process. Mm -hmm. And we have some great people working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Brown has time again said that uh, or held that he is pragmatic progressive conservative leader. He recently said it in uh, the convention. How would you define his pragmatism? Well, I think the fact that he's willing to embrace new ideas across the party spectrum uh, is, is a first indicator of that. I think the fact that he is not coming with a lot of preset conditions on how the province can run better, I think he's willing to open himself up. I also think that he is uh, when I say pragmatic, he would be the sort of person like a Bill Davis type leader where he recognizes that government is there to spend money. You cannot not spend money being a government, but you want to spend it wisely, you want to spend it efficiently, and you want to make sure that you're not wasting any of the taxpayers' money. So you have to have respect for the money that you're spending. And that means investing in 
infrastructure that is important, hardcore infrastructure, roads, rail, uh, transit. It means investing in um, the services that are important to Ontario, a good education system, a good health care system. Those are the priorities that, that I believe Patrick Brown is going to focus on. But again, we don't want to prejudge the outcome of our policy platform. I think we have to let that evolve, and I think Patrick is going to look at the good ideas that come forward from talking to all Ontarians and say this is where we can make an immediate impact. This is where we can have a platform and a policy that will make Ontario a better place to, to live, work and play. And I think those are the sort of things that we're going to see from him. He's not coming in with this idea that we've got to cut spending for the sake of cutting spending. I think he's going to say let's cut some wasteful spending. Uh, he's not going to come in and say let's cut taxes for the sake of cutting taxes. He's going to say which taxes no longer make sense, which taxes are not an effective way to drive the economy forward. Which, which costs are holding us back? Hydro costs, for example. How can we make Ontario a better place to invest in? And that's what, what I think pragmatic conservative means. So his pragmatism is going to reflect in his policy process, right? Without question. He's not, he's not coming out with any preconceived notions. Okay. Uh, so Tony, um, everyone knows that there is no partisanship in municipal politics or uh, you know, when you're ele being elected for municipalities. How do you juggle uh, with the Liberals and the Conservatives at the same time? You know, that's a, that's a great question because one of the questions I get asked a lot, being a very proudly partisan uh, municipal councillor, is how do you work with with the Liberals on council? Or how do you work with, uh, with the NDP guys on council? And it's funny because uh, I think that there is a group, especially in Niagara, there is a group of people who, despite their... Uh, partisan leanings at the provincial and federal level want to work together to make Niagara a better place. And we see where at the municipal level it goes back to the idea of we need to invest in our local infrastructure. Uh, we need to spend money on the services that are important to all Niagarans. And when we work together as a group we actually get a lot of stuff done. And I always uh, make the joke like one of the closest people I, I serve with on council who sits beside me is uh, a councillor from Niagara Falls and she is a diehard liberal. She has run for the liberals uh, provincially. Um, she is always going on about how great the liberals are and we have a lot of fun with it because she knows that I am a diehard conservative. Uh, but at the end of the day when we sit down and look at it issue by issue if you can allow yourself to not look at things through a partisan uh, lens, um, you can actually get things done when you're willing to work together. And I think that actually speaks volumes for uh, being pragmatic about things. You need to work with others. So I would say that there is definitely some compromise. There are definitely those on council who don't want to compromise. Um, there are those on council that are so far right, they just think all government spending is wrong and that we shouldn't spend any money uh, from the taxpayers' point of view, save them all the money of the region. Uh, and then there's other people on the far left who just want to give away everything uh, and we can always raise taxes later. So I think if you have a, a large group working in a centrist way at the municipal level, the municipal government is there to spend money. So we just want to make sure we spend it wisely. We keep taxes low. Niagara Region uh, came in with a 0% tax increase this year which was done because we all work together, especially those across party lines. Uh, we set guidance uh, to the staff of a 0% increase, um, and that was endorsed wholeheartedly by the entire council. So there is a recognition that we need to do the things that will move Niagara forward together. So uh, I actually like the approach we have at municipal politics better than the provincial and federal ones because we do have to cross party lines. We do have to work closely with each other. And Niagara has one of the largest councils at the municipal level. There at 30, I believe we're the third largest mm -hmm. uh, behind um, uh, Toronto City Council and I think it's Chatham-Kent I believe has 32 members and we have 30, uh, 31 with our regional chair. And so when you have a council that large you have to be able to work together. You can't let personality get in the way. You can't let partisan po politics get in the way. Okay, uh, let me draw your attention to a very um, important point which has been laid by the Liberal uh, government, that is the sex ed. Uh, yeah. Very many communities, uh, particularly communities coming from the Eastern countries and cultures, they do not like uh, the sex uh, education curriculum uh, being introduced in the schools. How is uh, Patrick Brown, the pragmatic leader, Patrick Brown, going to change it or uh, maybe um, 
what, what is the take on uh, well, well, the I don't think I can. I don't think I can speak specifically for Patrick on this. I th mm -hmm. I think one of the things that was very clear uh, as the liberals rolled out this agenda is that they did not take the time to properly consult with parents across Ontario. They were happy to to allow it to be the old liberal adage: "I know better than you." Uh, I know better than you on how to raise your kids. I know how, better than you how to spend your money, um, and that's where. I think the personal responsibility that conservatives generally believe in uh, has been uh, given an opportunity to come back to the fore. And I would say this, on the sex education curriculum specifically, uh, I have a, a daughter, 13 years of age, she's starting to go through that, get that curriculum at school. Uh, and we're fortunate that the, our two children attend the Catholic school, it's a small Catholic school in Grimsby, and they are very respectful of how they're dealing with it. They make sure the parents are fully aware of everything that's being taught. Um, they do it with a very um, focused uh, approach to it. So I, I, I'm not as unhappy with the rollout of the, the, the sex education s curriculum in our school as they're doing it. But I understand how frustrating it is when you're being told how this is gonna come about and you have no say on it. And if you have a very, um, different approach to sex education in your family or in your culture or however that works. Uh, I think that this sort of I know best from Kathleen Wynne has really been a, a, a turnoff uh, for a lot of people who may have considered voting liberal in the past. It, it's that sort of um, top-down approach, the lack of consultation with parents, and at the end of the day, the education system is a partnership between the community, the parents, the children, the teachers and the government and and it can't be one group pulling uh, pulling everyone along in the same direction there has to be a proper consultation mm -hmm. and and in this particular instance I don't think that happened very well I think what we're going to find is that there will be pushback you have people bringing keeping their kids out of school when it's being taught um, and I think that that speaks to the uh, the current liberal government's we know best attitude yeah, because let the parents decide what they want to do, what they want to teach the kids. Uh, and when, and, and how, when, right. Exactly. So I think there is there is an aspect to that that's sort of been mm -hmm. missing. And I, th I don't know what Patrick's uh, solution will be on this, but I do know that there are many members in our caucus who believe that there has to be a greater involvement in uh, the parental organizations that are out there and, and making sure that the the groups that are being dismissed out of hand have a voice to say you know what this is not what we want our kids to be taught at this stage right and that's where where we have to at least have a conversation okay wonderful thank you very much tony for being here with no me problem. At uh, power dilemmas and thank you very much viewers for uh, listening to the second vice president of ontario pc party as well as uh, the councillor of uh, Niagara Region from the town of Grimsby, Tony Cork. Uh, we talked about a few issues uh, uh, pertaining to the uh, province of Ontario, like sex ed. We talked about uh, politics, municipal politics, and a lot of other uh, issues. So uh, stay tuned for my show, Power Dilemmas with Sarah Bukhari. Thank you. Number one multicultural channel. This is. Tag TV.